chapter 4, looking at verses 1 to 5 today. I appreciate those of you who prayed for us. I asked you at the end of last Sunday morning service to pray for Karen and me because we had gotten word that my, uh, my lifelong friend, no one, one of us since childhood, and actually were uh, tennis partners in high school. He was steady. I was unpredictable. But uh, that he was in the last stages of pancreatic cancer. And, and you prayed, and God opened a way for us to go. And we got to be with James and Nancy, walked in the room. We hadn't seen them in some time. We just picked up right where we had left off with them and had a time to weep with them and laugh with them and to pray with them. Uh, and he told us, when we left, he, said, he said, God brought you here today at this particular time. While we were there, five different specialists walked in the room and, and gave them just dire news. That there was nothing else that could be done for, <clears throat> for this. Nothing else could be done. The last one was the infectious disease specialist who said, we can't, we have nothing to treat the bacteria with. And he, he died on Wednesday, their 43rd wedding anniversary. And so thank you for praying. We know he's with the Lord. He's, he's better off than any of us right now. First Corinthians chapter 4, we're looking today at this, this idea of, of servants and stewards of Jesus Christ. Paul is still, he, he is still dealing with this thing that greatly troubles him, how the Corinthian church has chosen up uh, their favorite preacher, pitting him against the other preachers. And he's not happy about it because it has debilitating uh, influence on the well-being of the church and the, and the health of the advance of the gospel there. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Stand with me if you would. Uh, I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen for you, but I do want you to get your own copy of the Scriptures, and we'll try to help you with that if you'll let us know. Follow along as I read verses 1 to 5. This is how one should regard, regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby, thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. This is what? It, it's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. As we study this today, obviously Paul is speaking uh, primarily about how you view ministers, but the application goes to anyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. How uh, we should be viewed, how we should view one, one another and ourselves, and remember that what counts finally is how God views us. Thank you. Please be seated. I grew up in a family of six children, and my mother had a saying from time to time when there was things to be done, uh, and, and it seemed like that, uh, that more were willing to give direction than were willing to do. And she said, we have, what we have here is too many chiefs and not enough Indians. And what she meant by that was, I guess, of course, that would be, that'd be appalling today, I think. It'd probably be carried off somewhere. And, but, uh, but back then, uh, what she meant was, we need to put our hands to the, to the plow here. Way too many people uh, giving advice and uh, pointing here and there. The same th kind of thing happens in churches. Uh, it can happen at either end of things. It can happen where, where pastors sort of take on a... Uh, a CEO role, you know, uh, you, you've seen the type there. Too important to get their hands dirty, um, like to give directions, snap here, snap there. Uh, the other side of the coin, however, is uh, 
congregations that want to uh, do that very thing to their pastors. <clears throat> Neither of those models is good. Uh, and Paul, Paul is really getting down to the, to the heart of the problem here with the language that he uses. He's still troubled. He is still troubled. Uh, I was reading John MacArthur's commentary. He says, there's a popular game played by many Christians it's that of evaluating pastors. And they use all kinds of criteria to determine who's successful, uh, uh, who the most influential, the most gifted, the most effective. He, he said, and the, the, I've, I've seen these things, some magazines periodically make surveys, and write up extensive reports, uh, carefully ranking pastors by uh, size of church membership, the attendance and worship services, the size of the staff, the attendance in Sunday school, the academic accomplishments, the degrees, real or honorary, um, the books written, articles written, uh, number of messages given at high-profile conferences and conventions. And then he says this, as popular as that practice may be, it is exceedingly offensive to God. And I agree, because it's what it's doing is the very thing that Paul has just chided these people earlier in as we've been studying. Stop drawing from the world's toolbox to evaluate the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he has slammed the notion of worldly wisdom. Rather be, rather be counted a fool than to embrace the way the world thinks. So he still has these concerns over the divisions happening in Corinth because of Paul, Apollos, and Peter, or Cephas. And the point he wants to make here that we should remember for ministers and for one another, by the way, is that all who are true to Scripture, all who are faithful, we're going to see this word servant and steward, all who are faithful to the Scripture should be treated equally. All who value, sound doctrine, personal holiness, the mission, as Brother Norman was speaking to this morning in, in Sunday school, the mission to be disciples who make disciple makers. When you find that, there's no justification for, for ranking, for preferring God's servants, because he doesn't. And when we do, then we set ourselves above God or, or act as if we're, we're wiser than God. So I want us to see in this uh, passage this morning briefly that, that when it comes to the people God calls to ministry, he is interested in, in who the person is, what his character is, uh, and what, what he's, how he's accomplishing what he's been called to do and how he executes that calling specifically. We're going to look at three things. God is looking for servants and stewards. God is looking for faithful servants and stewards. And then God expects his faithful servants and stewards to be accountable chiefly, not exclusively, chiefly to him. So let's look at this real quickly here. First of all, God is looking for servants and stewards. Uh, verse 1 there, this is how one should regard us. Paul says, you guys have an idea. You, and apparently, when he's, the way he's talking, they've been ranking one another. Well, you know, Paul... Paul really, he's got a great, rich Jewish background, and he brings that, that whole Jewish training to bear. Peter, Peter's just a, man, he just, he's, he's unfiltered. He just, whatever he's, he's on his mind, he lets you have it. Apollos, Apollos is so, so erudite. He's, he's, he's so skilled as a communicator. We know these things about them from, from the texts of Scripture. Paul says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Servants, stewards. That's how you ought to be seen. Paul, Apollos, Peter, or Cephas. Not skill sets, uh, not communication abilities. In fact, if you read, you read into 2 Corinthians and some other places, Paul really was dogged 
by folks. He calls them at one point super apostles. He, uh, they were the Judaizers who come in behind him very often. And, and they had all sorts of unkind things to say about him. He says, that's no way to view God's gifts to his church. This idea of being a servant of Christ. The pastor, the minister, first and foremost, serves Christ. And when you serve Christ, you, you do so by valuing the gospel, the message about him. This word servant here <clears throat> is not the one you would typically find uh, in the New Testament. The, the one that you would typically come across is the one for slave, common house slave. This is an interesting word here. It is literally under rower. Under rower. This is, the, this is the galley slave. This is the guy who is beneath the deck. Rowing the oar. Now, if you have that picture, you've ever seen movies that, that capture that, there's not really a pecking order <laughs> in the under rowers. I mean, they're on, the, they're on the hard bench. They've got the row extended, the oar extended to them, and they're, they're pulling for all their... And, and they typically are not recognized unless they're not doing their job, and then they get recognized in the wrong way. That's the word he uses here. Uh, under rower. We're, we're servants. We're, we're, we're going somewhere, taking the ship, the church somewhere, with Christ as the head. We're not the captain on the bow with the spyglass. Paul says we're under rowers. Christ is the one. And we look to Christ is the one from whom we take our, our orders, our direction. Christ is the one whose well done, good and faithful servant we want to hear. Servants of Christ. Luke uses the same, uh, same term. Galley slaves were not exalted one above another. They had a common rank the lowest, the lowest rank. And that's how Paul says, this is how you need to, you need to see us. We must be, first of all, ministers. But then also, anyone who names the name of Jesus Christ and who says, I'm on the mission. Because see, when God saved you by grace through faith, if you want to use Paul's analogy, he placed you in the, in the bottom of the boat uh, to grab hold of an oar and row. There's a pastor who used to serve in this area. He's, he's now in Texas. And I remember he said one time, he said, you know, when you're rowing the boat, you don't have time to be rocking the boat. I thought that was good. When you're rowing, you don't have time to be causing division, contention, strife. And Paul has said earlier, so it's not the one who plants or one who, who waters. It's a different analogy he uses. It's God who gives the increase. And so, so God is looking. He wants servants. Jesus said to his apostles, said, the, the Gentiles lord it over one another. And if, you, if you've ever studied that, that passage and, and you could dig down into it, when he, when he describes that, the Gentiles lord it over the way he's, we, we read it in a, real, real pretty in our English versions, it should not be so with you. That's not the way it reads. Not so you. There's an indignation that comes from it. We're to be servants. The best churches are led by servant leaders made up of people who try to outdo one another in service. You may recall, I think it, and I believe it was the first Sunday night I was your pastor. If not, it was shortly after that. We passed out towels. Said servant leader, we gave them to the staff. We gave them to the deacons. Servant leaders to lead serving. That's what Paul says, first of all. Uh, a servant of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, 16. 
He says, if, if I preach the gospel, I don't have any ground for boasting. Well, look at me, I preach. He says, that, that's no, there's nothing to boast about there. He says, because I, I'm preaching because I, I have to. There's a, there's a necessity. There's a compulsion. And then he goes on and says, in fact, I'm so compelled to preach the gospel. I didn't sit down and look at a career choice and say, hmm, I think being a preacher, I know some guys that have done that, and it's been a disaster. No, he says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. It was an older minister said to me when I was in my early 20s. He said, young man, if you can do anything in life and have a sense of fulfillment and purpose and calling, then do it. Because the only people we need preaching are preach people who are compelled to do so, who, f who have a sense before God of a woe upon me if I do not preach the gospel. So it was no cause of boasting for, for Paul. Uh, in fact, there's, in the ministry, if you stay in it any time at all, uh, you're going to find this tension, this tension. And Paul describes it very well uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, 6 verses 8 to 10. This is how he described what, what it was like for him to be in the ministry. Through honor so and dishonor, through slander and praise, we're treated as impostors. In other words, people were questioning his motives for what he was doing, and yet are true. As unknown, yet well known, dying, behold, we live, punished, but not killed, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, yet possessing everything. Paul was there. He was in the trenches. He understood the, the, uh, the tensions, the enigma, the, uh, the apparent contradictions of life as a gospel minister. So you see, what he's trying to tell these folks in Corinth is you shouldn't make, make much or little of the different ministers God's brought through because they need to find chiefly their value in God, and you shouldn't distract them from doing that. Opinions vary and change. I can remember at another church where I served. I first came there. The church called me to come serve as pastor. Several years later, there was a young lady. She, she, was, uh, she just became like a daughter to us, and she grew up as we were there. And she came to me one day, and she said, uh, said Brother Bill, I, I need to uh, repent to you. And I, I said, okay, why? And she said, when you first came here, I didn't like you because you took the place of my pastor. She was a little girl and had lived under one pastor, and she saw me as coming in, sort of, sort of pushing him aside, you know, get out of the way I'm coming. She said, I didn't like you. She said, but she said, I really thank God that he brought you here. So, so there was that, that change. I've seen changes the other way, too, you know. I've, I've had people uh, stand. There was a time in, in the ministry at one particular church, if the fellow stood up in the, in the church uh, meetings and something, and said, I'll tell you what, I thank God for our pastor. I went, oh, my goodness, he's on the way out. Because that was kind of a pattern that developed there for a season. Had the other happen. Paul knew about it. Anyone that's spent any time in the ministry will know about it. You look... To God. God, am I, am I being faithful with the gospel? Am I magnifying Jesus Christ and not, not myself? You see, when you walk out of here, any, any time we gather, whether it's sitting in my office or gathered like this or in a teaching time, when you walk out, I, I want, I desperately want you to think more highly of Jesus Christ. And I say this with judgment day honesty. I'm, I don't care if, if you forget my name. May the name of Christ resonate. That's, that is a gospel minister's heart and attitude. But not just, not just a servant of Jesus Christ and therefore a servant, but a steward. He says a steward of God's mysteries. This, uh, this idea of a, of a steward is a, is a person responsible uh, in the household. You know, Paul... Uh, uses this term, this household, uh, the guy responsible for what's happening in the household. The, the master leaves, goes on a trip, he leaves his steward in charge. 
And he comes back and he holds his steward accountable for, the, for what he finds in the household, how things are going. Peter said that Christians, Christians are to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Paul said to Titus that stewards must be above reproach as a, as a steward of God. This idea of mystery, we've seen this before. I've told you before, it's, it's a, one of those words that comes to us. It's not translated from the Greek text. It's, it's simply transliterated. If you, could, if you could read it in the Greek, it's the word musterion. So you hear that, musterion. Well, it's just come to us as mystery. What is that? <clears throat> what is the mystery? Well, it's not a mystery novel. We've looked at this before. Uh, it speaks of that which was hidden and can only be known by divine revelation. What's the point? Nobody, no mere son of Adam or daughter of Eve would ever figure out the gospel. The gospel only becomes meaningful and powerful and clear when, as Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Simon. My Father in heaven revealed this to you. Stewards of that mystery, stewards, good stewards of that which will never be known apart from our declaring it, and God being pleased to attach the Spirit to it. As we looked at Wednesday night, the wind of the Spirit, to open blinded eyes, to unstop deaf ears, to, to soften hard hearts, to raise dead bones to life. We're stewards of the mystery. Therefore, we dare not water it down. We dare not make it palatable. We dare not make it clever. Paul's already said it's, 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 the gospel is an offense. It's the offense of the cross. And it's more offensive in our culture today, perhaps, than it's ever been in the history of this nation. It has an exclusivity about it. It has a, it has a, uh, a payment about it. It addresses sin, takes sin seriously. It says sin must be atoned for. The gospel, we're stewards of that. We must guard it. That's what he said to Timothy. Guard the deposit. Guard this, this word. Paul could say to the Ephesian elders, you remember this when we were looking through Ephesians and we look over at Acts 20 where he has this, this last meeting with them at Miletus. He could say in chapter 20 of Acts, I, I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Gentiles, declaring to you the whole counsel or the whole purpose of God. That's the challenge, really. The challenge when you teach, a Sunday school teacher that teaches for any length of time at all, the preacher who preaches any length of time at all, is not to ride your hobby horses, but to declare the whole counsel of God. Not get on those things that, that just tickle your fancy or that fascinate you, but to declare the whole counsel of God. Because all Scripture, we know, is God-breathed. All Scripture is profitable. You know, you're not required to fully understand all the truths declared in Scripture. But we are required to faithfully proclaim them. And it's in that faithful proclamation that we believe God is pleased by the Spirit that then take those things and open blinded eyes. Have them take on meaning in people's lives. The, the aha moments. When the light switch goes on, that which was once darkened. Otherwise, we find ourselves, if we're not, if we're not faithful to this, this gospel proclamation, this gospel declaration, this gospel application, if we're not faithful to that, then we come across in what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 2 when he he said, he said, we're not. <laughs> he said, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphant procession and spreads through us everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. He said, for we are to God, the aroma of Christ in those who are, uh, who are perishing as well as in those who are being saved. To the ones who are perishing were the aroma of death, where the, the gospel stinks to the person who is perishing and will not consider it. It's offensive. To the others... For those who are being saved, it's the aroma of life unto life. And he says, who is sufficient for this? You see, when you understand how the gospel is received, you have to ask, who is sufficient for this? And then he says, but unlike many, well, that's tragic, first century 
during the time of Paul, unlike many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. But, he says, we speak with sincerity as men sent from God in the very presence of God. That's what he's talking about here. God is the one. Consider us servants of Christ, stewards of the mystery. So he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, that's the, it's a mercy that the Lord calls anybody to the ministry. It's the mercy that the Lord calls someone to teach. It's a mercy that the Lord does this. Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. You don't mess with the gospel. You don't water it down. You don't make it fit. You don't, you don't as one fellow said to me, he said, I just preach the parts I understand that make sense. I said, well, you don't have much of a Bible then. You got a tiny, tiny Bible. I don't understand the virgin birth. I don't understand how God can speak ex nihilo, create out of nothing. I don't understand how God has always been. I take the revelation of Scripture as declaring it, and I embrace it because it's revealed in Scripture. But there are things I don't, if, if, you, if you whittle it down to what you don't, what you understand, you don't have much left. Secondly, God is looking for faithful servants and stewards. Faithful. Verse 2, it's required stewards that they be found faithful. Not successful, not popular, faithful. That's all we want to hear in the end. Well done, good and faithful servant. A faithful steward, as we've already said to you, values the gospel and doesn't stray from it. You know, I preach the gospel to myself every day. I get up, I need to be reminded. And if you ever catch me downcast and hanging down, you know, well, Askel has not preached the gospel to himself today. He's come along and said, don't, re don't forget, <laughs> Christ died and rose again. The tomb is still empty. We need to remind one another of that every day. Be faithful to the gospel. Matthew 24, uh, 45 and 46, Jesus is getting to the end of his ministry, and he says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household? There's that stewardship, you see. To give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Spiritually feeding one another. We ought to be doing that. Folks ought to be able to count on spiritual food from us. We talk about being a blessing. Blessing people. Blessing people. We ought to do that. When the master comes, he's going to want to know. You've been a faithful servant, a steward, Third thing, let me, let me move quickly here. God expects his faithful servants and stewards to be accountable chiefly to him. Notice verses 3 to 5. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. You, Paul's saying there, I know what you're doing. You've judged me. You've, you've found flaws in me, and you've picked that. Well, I, I like this better in Peter than I do in Paul. So that's, that's small to me. That's, that's being small, so it's a small matter to me, Paul said. He said, in fact, I don't even judge myself. And what he's talking about there is not, he's not contradicting himself because in other places he does require to, to stop uh, looking out and, and search yourself, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. But here he's talking about judging the effectiveness of his ministry. He's not doing a poll. He's not looking around to see how many people like him. He's not checking. He, he said, I don't judge myself in these matters. For I'm not aware of anything against myself. He, now watch what he does here. But I'm not there by quitting. In other words, I... I hear these things about me, but Paul says, I, 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 don't, I don't see the merit of them. He said, but don't, don't hear me saying that I'm perfect. I don't think I'm perfect. I, I'm not acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me, and that's where he's headed. The Lord is my judge. He's your judge. Why would we spend any time judging one another? We're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will all hear from him. What he says is the final word on it. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. And that's what he's getting down to. That's what they were doing in, in, in pairing up and getting party spirit behind Paul, Apollos, Peter. They were judging. They were being judgmental. Before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and 
One commentator I agree with, he said, he said this is not the things that, that these ministers, Paul, Apollos, Peter, and others like them are doing that when, they, when they're just exposed, you go, oh my goodness. No, he said, these are things that no one else sees, that the Lord knows. That he knows about his servants. That he will bring them to light. Jesus said over and over in the book of Revelation to those churches in chapters 2 and 3, I know your works, I know your deeds. And many times no one else knows them. But the Lord will bring them to light and celebrate them. Disclose the purposes of the heart. You see, they were, they were questioning the motives. When people, when people judge preachers, they're questioning their motives. And he says, then each one will receive his commendation from God. And that's the key word there. He said, I don't need your commendation. I'm entrusting myself to the one whose commendation I will hear one day. And what is that? What is that commendation? I've said it several times. Well done. Good and faithful servant. That's what, you see, we should live for the glory of God. Every one of us here, the name's the name of Jesus Christ. Live for the glory of God. Whatever we do, eating, drinking, do all the glory of God. But we live to hear, well done. If I know I have that, and brothers and sisters, if you know you have that, we don't have to hear another well done from anybody else. But if we don't have that, then it doesn't matter how many accolades. Because this is the one that matters finally. Are you living for that today? Are you striving to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ? The aroma of Christ in those lives you're encountering. To the ones being saved, precious. To those who are, who are perishing, stinking but striving to be the aroma of Christ, recognizing God is the only one who changes those spiritual nostrils. So that you hear in the end, well done. Oh, I want to hear that. I want to hear that. Well done. I do not want to be the fellow Paul described earlier who's saved, but though as by fire saved by the skin of his teeth, I want to hear from the Lord. Well done. Good faithful servant. I want that for you. I want that for you. I want to challenge you. Renew. Recommit. God, strengthen me anew and afresh to so live for Christ while I live that when I come to die, well done. I told James Brady, we were there in the room, there were several physicians and nurses that came in. And I'm not being prejudiced. I just want to point, not a one of them came from a, an Anglo-American background. They were all uh, Middle Eastern, Eastern Indian. I told James, I said, James, you've, you would not have met these people in the cubicle, the accounting cubicle at the Southwest Texas Medical Center where you were an accountant. God's placed you right in the middle of people who do not know the gospel. And I said, my prayer for you is that you've been such the aroma of Christ to them that one day when you're in heaven, by God's grace, some of these folks are going to walk up to you and say, you know, you may not remember me, but I cared for you. And I saw Jesus in you. And you prayed for me. And you shared the gospel with me. I want that. I want that for you. And if you're, not, if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, oh, you don't have to put that off. You don't have to put that off. Say, so, well, there's so much I don't understand. Thank God it's not about understanding. Thank God it's about trusting yourself to him who gives understanding. That's all. It's a simple matter of confessing I am a sinner deserving of condemnation an eternal separation from God in hell. And yet I see in this book, this preacher has told me that Jesus came and lived and died and rose again for someone like me. And I simply, in acknowledging my sin, simply say, I receive Jesus. I believe him. I believe he is the Savior. I believe he will save me. It's, it's, it's simple as that, friends. It's not complicated. 
Don't let the devil convince you you've got to figure this out and figure that out. No, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. And my prayer is that if you're not there yet, <laughs> that God has somebody, maybe several somebodies in your life, who are the aroma of Christ to you. And one day, by God's grace, your spiritual nostrils are going to take in Christ, and he's going to be sweet and altogether lovely, and you're going to want to know him. You're going to have to have him as your Lord and Savior. That's my prayer for you. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, oh, Lord, help us to live with an ear that wants to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us to follow Paul's counsel here and not fall into being judgmental, picking this one over that one, playing favorites, doing all the things that, are, that really look more like the world and look nothing like the church. Help us here to, to be increasingly committed to having servant hearts that, that have servant feet and servant hands and servant lips. Help us to see the, the challenge and the value of being found good stewards of the mysteries of the gospel that, that you have given to us in the Scripture and that you've promised if we will declare it, you will open eyes to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. Help us so to live as we come to the end of the journey and hear, well done, well done. And help those here who are not even on the journey yet because they've not yet confessed faith in Christ. Oh, may we in their presence be the aroma of Christ. It right now may seem pungent, may seem silly, foolish, not making any sense. But all oh, by your grace, we'll take on the properties of sweetness and preciousness and that they will soon find Jesus altogether lovely. We pray this for your glory, for the good of their souls, for the advance of the gospel from this place. In Jesus' name, amen.